Okay, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the third installment of the Doylestown Democrats Vote Local interview series. I'm Judy Dixon. I'm a committee person with the Doylestown Democrats. Asking our local officials, what is it that you do, is the starting point for today's discussion on getting to know local officials and local government better. So many of us know about what's going on nationally than we do in our own backyard. So together, a group from the Doylestown Democrats, a group of volunteers, put together this seven-part interview series. We hope you enjoy it. As a note, the session is being recorded and will be available on the Doylestown Democrats website. As mentioned, this is the third installment of seven part series. The, the first two sessions, we talked with Doylestown Borough Council and a Township. And this session, we're going to be speaking with our county commissioners. Then we'll go monthly. Next month, we'll be speaking with school board directors, the following month, we'll be speaking with row offices, and then we'll move on to state elected and past elected officials. So a quick roadmap to this evening's. You are here, this will be introductions. I'll be introducing our guests shortly. And then we'll be moving to a 35 minute recorded session that was done in a COVID safe environment during that time, you can put your questions into Q&A because after the recorded session, we'll be back live. Bonnie Chang has some pre-formulated questions that we will be asking. And then we'll also be asking some of your questions that you've put into the Q&A. Then lastly, we'll talk about how you can get local and get more engaged. So a quick overview of the Bucks County government. There are three divisions. Uh, the commissioners who we're speaking to of them tonight are elected positions. Then there are row offices that provide a, provide, uh, a multitude of functions. There are nine of them. They are also elected positions. Then there's an administrative arm of the government too. They are not elected positions, but they fulfill a lot of the policies and initiatives that the county commissioners have put in place. So the office of the county commissioners, there are three of them. They serve four year terms, uh, two from the majority party and one from the minority party. They oversee the Bucks County operating budget, which in 2020 surpassed $450 million. There's over 2,400 full-time employees making Bucks County one of the largest employers in the county. Uh, the uh, commissioners determine how much money the row offices get and how much the various departments get. And the county commissioners are responsible for determining the policies and initiatives that the county takes on. And this is just a quick pie chart. You can see from the 2021 expenditures that health and human services took up a good 36% of the budget with the courts and, cor and corrections taking over an additional 25%. We'll be talking more about this with the commissioners. So some brief introductions about the recorded session. Connor O'Hanlon, who is the chair of the Doylestown Democrat, will be conducting the recorded session of the interview. And Diane Ellis Marsiglia is our county commissioner and chair of the commissioners. And Bob Harvey is the county commissioner and vice chair. Commissioner Diane Ellis Marseglia is a licensed clinical social worker. She was first elected in 2007 and became the board chair in 2020 when the Democrats won the majority of the commissioner seats. She is a lifelong resident of Bucks County. She holds a bachelor's in sociology and criminal justice and a master's in social work. She went to the University of Delaware for her undergraduate and her master's was at the University of Pennsylvania. She was previously a social worker for over two decades, a clinical social worker in Bucks County. She also serves as the county representative to the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquencies, to the Bucks County Emergency Health Council, and to the local Emergency Planning Commission. 
She also teaches at Bucks County Community College. Commissioner Bob Harvey was first elected in 2020 and he now serves as the vice chair. He holds a bachelor's degree in history and master's in education. He is also a lifelong Bucks County resident. Previously, he was a teacher for over 20 years and chairman of the social studies department at the Bucks County Technical High School. He was also a Falls Township Supervisor where he served as chair from 2008 to 2020. He also serves as the county representative. He's chair of the Bucks County Board of Elections, a very important seat right now. And he also is the vice chair of the Bucks County Prison Oversight Board. Bob also represents the commissioners on a variety of government affiliated entities, such as the Delaware Valley Planning Commission. So now we'll be moving on to our recorded session. Please stay tuned for the live session that follows. Hello and welcome to the third interview of the Doylestown Democrat Vote Local Interview Series. I am Conor O'Hanlon, the chairman of the Doylestown Democrats, and today I am joined by the two Democratic County Commissioners of Bucks County, Diane Marseglia and Bob Harvey. We're going to dive right into this today, and I'm going to ask you guys, what are the main functions of the County Commissioners? First of all, good afternoon, and how great did that sound to hear the two Democratic commissioners of Bucks County? I'm still not quite used to that yet. Um, so I guess I can start first with the um, obligations of a county commissioner. And it's funny because it's probably the question that we get asked most is what do county commissioners do? And we do a whole, we are in charge of, I guess, a budget of about $450 million. And there are over around 640,000 people in Bucks County. So we're trying to make that budget make the, meet the needs of those people. We have a nursing home under us. The county jail comes under us. Children and youth, which is where anybody with abused or neglected children would call. And we have 200 social workers there. So it's a big, big program. The mental health department comes under us. Technically, drug and alcohol services come under us. Um, the Board of Election, which Bob was the chair last year. What else am I forgetting? You, now you go, tag team. So it's a lot of things that, it's a lot of, of parts of life that people don't even think about. You know, the, there's a park and rec system in this county uh, that we oversee. There are over 100 bridges uh, that the county has possession of. You know, a few of the covered type, which of course everyone kind of knows where they are, and that's part of the tourist attraction of Bucks, but also just the more uh, not so kind of uh, unique concrete and steel bridges uh, that the county has control over. Um, I always point out the things that people never think about, which is that the county health department inspects every single restaurant in Bucks County. Uh, so when you go into a restaurant, you see you know a health department you know uh, certification up there. That's the Bucks County Board of Health that does that. Um, the Consumer Protection and Weights and Measures uh, they actually go out and inspect every single gas pump and every single scale uh, in the county. So every every time you go to the supermarket and buy lunch meat. Anytime you go, um, you know, buy you know buy vegetables or whatever it is when you when you put it on a scale, that is measured. Every gas pump's measured and certified by uh, uh, weights and measures every year. And so that's things that people never think of. That that falls under us. We um, also have a planning commission under us and community and housing development, which is pretty big because we are trying to deal with housing issues and the lack of affordable housing in Bucks County. So that falls under us. Could you? Expand on what the planning commission is for people. I know that that it sounds like it's pretty obvious, but I think because it's so important, could one could one of you guys expand on that a little bit? I served uh, before I became a commissioner. I was on um, the Falls Township Board of Supervisors for 16 years, and before that, I was uh, on the Falls Township Planning Commission. And so, the job of a of a local township uh, or borough planning commission is really different in some ways than what the county one is. The County Planning Commission does review plans for developments that are going to come in, residential, commercial, industrial, etc. Uh, but the Planning Commission also is in, in some ways sort of the engineering part of the county government. So when they're looking at bridges that need to be repaired and they're putting together the bid specs and doing the work to, worth our general services to figure out how do we get this done, they're looking for funding. Uh, trails that are done, there's an upper Bucks trail that just would cut the ribbon on I guess about a month and a half ago. Um, and there's a, other trails we're looking to build. That goes through the Planning Commission. Uh, they're looking at things, really planning for the future. So when we talk about affordable housing, when we talk about the need for uh, services that people might uh, be looking for, and maybe we're not 
advertising those as well. Maybe there are things we're missing. Uh, the planning commission would do surveys uh, to Bucks County residents to find out what is it that you like about Bucks County, what are some things that need to be improved on, and then they would help set up a comprehensive plan for the county. So we just learned that there's a ton that goes into the county and planning and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of moving parts there, it looks like. So how big is the government? And we you mentioned how, how big the budget is. And how do you work with the row officers? So that's another important thing I was thinking of, that we supply the court system with money to run the court system and the building and all the resources they need, as well as the budgets and the resources for the nine row officers. So um, that's, that's our primary purpose. They get to run their offices pretty independently, but they, they need to get their budget from us. I don't know if that's a good example of the check and balance in government. And obviously having you know, eight of the nine row offices are controlled by Democrats. Um, you know, the district attorney is the only Republican and his seat is up this year. So that's obviously going to be uh, a major focus of this election year. As in addition to four currently Democratic held Rose offices, which we took in 2017, that we really want to hold on to. Um, but now that we have this sort of the first time maybe ever <laughs> that this many Democrats have been elected at the county level, we really can look to do things collaboratively. When it comes to, you know, we're looking for ways to save money, looking for ways to save energy. Um, how do we uh, go paperless in this county? Uh, you know, and how do each of the row offices can put together ideas of how can they cut back on that? We're going to be launching a new website. Um, hopefully by June of this year, uh, we'll have a completely new website, which will be the first complete redesign of the website in 15 years. Uh, and certainly anybody who knows anything about technology and websites, to go 15 years and not change your website is just sort of, you know, you, you might as well just be using stone and chisels. Uh, but, um, but that kind of function, working with the row officers to say, what services can we put on the website that are going to help your office? What are the things that people need the most? What are the forms people need the most? Frequently asked questions. And so it's all a collaborative effort. Um, there are about 2,400, roughly 2,400 employees uh, in Bucks County. Everything from people who take care of the parks to, you know, judges, uh, you know, and, and their, you know, uh, assistants and, and all the people that work with them um, and all the rows and all their offices and prison and Board of Health and, and everything else. And obviously we can see that there's a budgeting process that probably, ha I think it happens every single year for the county as well. Um, with all of these parts coming together, how do you how do you prioritize certain things in the budget? How do you come up with, you know, that's the number and that's what we're going to go with? I think part of it is that there are certain things we're required to do by mm -hmm. the state and federal government. So we can't really change that. And also a lot of the things we have to do, we get to do are reimbursed from the state and federal government. So that's kind of a, that's the easy part because we're going to get reimbursed. And then, you know, I like to think that we should be looking at more how things are working and can they work better and then start to budget from there. Honestly, Bob and I have been doing a budget for a year and there was a pandemic, so. <laughs> Having worked in local government and I was a public school teacher for 26 years. And so I had to make budgets for my, for my own department. Um, the system is, is pretty much the same as what's in Doylestown Township or Doylestown Borough. Uh, over the summer, you have each of the department heads who's told this is how much money is going to be allotted for your department or agency put together a budget. Um, and they submit something. And of course, they always ask for more than what they're being told they're allowed. And it's up to our finance department to really kind of go through and start cutting. And at some point, though, the, it'll get to our level. A lot of times we've had, they have an idea ahead of time. We're really focusing on um, making changes with how we handle technology. You know, for example, and one of the things we had a transition team, which we formed right after we were elected, of about 70 volunteers. A lot of people in Doylestown uh, uh, helped with that, including elected officials um, here in the borough and, and township. And one of the recommendations, for example, was we've got way too many desktop printers. Everybody likes to have their own desktop printer. Um, and it costs, obviously, electricity, it's ink, it's replacing parts, it's, it's you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, so how do we transition out of that? You know, how do we get to people that are saying, well, we're going to need 15 desktop printers next year? Mm, no, <laughs> no. How about we look at something else? How about we look at just one large copier that also serves as a printer for your floor? You know, uh, and that way it's much more efficient in that sense. So those kinds of messages are sent. Uh, but as, as Diane said, it, in some ways it's like a school board where schools have to do certain functions. 
and I've had conversations with school board members. I know that's going to want to be one of your future interview sessions. Um, people running for school board, they think, well, I want to cut this and cut that and do this. And I, can see, I always say, you know, there's a lot of things in that budget you can't touch. You know, it's state requirement, federal requirement. Salaries and benefits are sort of locked in by contracts. So the amount of the budget you have to control obviously is very small. And then obviously we're dealing with a nice present that the Republicans left us, which is a seven and a half million dollar hole in our budget <laughs> that they never bothered to fill uh, and left it for us to have to deal with. Um, so we've been managing that pretty pretty smoothly, but we're trying to figure out how to make that hole go away without having to raise taxes. This is the first time we've had control of the commissioner's board in what, 38 years, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, tell me about what has changed. I mean, you talked about the budget and mm -hmm. Coming into coming into this, I mean, Diane, you've been on you've been on the uh, commissioner's um, board for a, for a little while now, but having control now, what has changed, and what have been some of the challenges from that change? Diane obviously was a commissioner for twelve years as the minority commissioner, and mm -hmm. and you know was sort of kept butting her head up against the wall trying to get things done, and yeah. um, and and did get many things done through her own abilities, but. Um, I think she's better talking about what's changed. You can have an idea and people don't say no and just shut it down. <laughs> they say things like, oh, how could we do that? And, and so that's really, it's very exciting to have that happen. And it goes to prove that I used to think maybe I just have bad ideas and that's why the Republicans mm -hmm. didn't take them. But now I'm realizing it's not necessarily that. It's because they weren't engaged. They didn't have the same interests. So now, I mean, I think we can come up with an idea, something we want to do, and we can find a way to, whether it's, it's not always money. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just getting the players to look at something a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in our previous interview with the supervisors, we had discussed this as well, where it's, it's something about values too. And, and certain values don't necessarily mean the bottom line, but it does, it, you can focus on the environment or you can focus on, you know, inclusion and diversity or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it just, it takes that next step. Now we can go back to COVID, which obviously is a unique, um, you know, it's a timepiece of where we are at right now. But, you know, Bob, this is your first year on the, on the as a commissioner, and you are thrown into a global pandemic. So can you guys talk about a little bit the challenges and the what you've learned maybe going through the, a global pandemic like this and how uh, government can, you know, function and help people? I, you know, one of the things we kept, it became sort of a, a standard line whenever we got emails, people asking about COVID and, and this, and that. And a lot of emails we got were uh, from people, especially in the springtime last spring when the governor was you were shutting down businesses. It was, you know, Wolf's a dictator and we should just ignore him and, and um, you know, that kind of, you know, ridiculousness. But I kept telling people, there's nobody on the planet anywhere who's ever had to govern at any level through this kind of pandemic. So, you know, everybody is trying to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, and in many cases, you know, we, we certainly we've uh, at every level you've had you know, early on, you know, did masks work? Did they not work? And there was some you know, and obviously we figured that out. And, you know, there was some dispute in early on in the pandemic about because it is so new. This is a new virus. Um, could it be passed from people who weren't symptomatic or, or could, we didn't know. Uh, and as you learn more, that's really been the biggest challenge is you're sort of fighting. It's almost like you're, you're blindfolded and, and, you know, and you don't know exactly where the opponent is, but you know, he's hitting you <laughs> or she's hitting you either <laughs> one. Um, and so you're, you're trying to swing sort of in the dark. Uh, and as you learn more, you start to realize, okay, here's how we focus. And this is not just us. This is literally the entire country in the world. We had regular calls really since this started, uh, very regular communication with all the counties around us, uh, Southeast PA, I should say, Monco, Delco, Chester, Philly, um, three times a week now. For a while, it was seven days a week uh, in the springtime. Um, and everybody, all of us are going through the same thing. You know, the county commissioners and council people and those other areas that, you know, Philly government, all just getting together, talking, asking each other, how are you handling this? How are you handling that? That's really been, you know, I think a silver lining. Um, you know, and, and it's part of the challenge, I think, and, and in, as falls sort of to Diane's been sort of the leader in this. You know, I'm obviously new to county government. 
Um, our other commissioner, the lone Republican, Gene DiGiolamo, is also new to county government. He was a state representative. We have a new chief operating officer uh, who was a county employee and headed up a division, and she became the COO. So now we have these sort of all these new people in place having to deal with this enormous problem. Uh, and the only person who had the experience to be able to sort of like guide us through was Diane because she had been there so long. Um, and so it, that's one of the big challenges is, is figuring out, we were just still getting our feet wet in terms of learning the job, and then this happens. Uh, and again, it's not like, you know, the, the county does have a pandemic guidebook, uh, which we're using now in terms of, uh, we've been using all year, really, but it, it doesn't necessarily cover anything of the scale. Um, and when you've got state involved, federal involved, it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot. Like you said, state and, uh, and federal involvement, but uh, we are obviously living in a very tumultuous time and we're going to be living in that for a long time. Uh, I guess, have you seen some challenges in vaccine distribution? Um, how much of the vaccine distribution falls on the county? Um, how much of it is just a, a matter of we need to wait for the federal government and, you know, maybe you guys can expand on that a little bit more in vaccine and maybe some of the uh, PPP and all that stuff that came out from the CARES Act and maybe we'll be getting some more stimulus in the future. But all of that, I guess, I know that's, again, that's another, you could do a lecture series probably just on that, but. The way I wanted to just try to address that is, you know, one of the good things, another silver lining was because we were all sort of new, I was new at being at being the chair and being yeah. a majority too, was that we had no no preconceptions of how it was supposed to be. We weren't going to do that. This is how we always did it. So we were able to be a little creative, which is really what you need when it's a new situation. But we did get that amount of money from the federal government that we were allowed to use. And we've been able to make some things in the county, people who were suffering, make it a little bit better. So we were able to use that money in a positive way. What we lacked was any kind of guidance from the federal government. And that's the same thing with a vaccine. And, and at the same time, what I've found is, be, especially because people are home so much, they're reading a lot, they're a lot on the internet, they're watching news channels all the time, and they're getting information that isn't always accurate to what the r real life is. You know, people watch and they see the vaccines in Florida and people are in these long lines and they wanna get in the same line in Pennsylvania, but that's not how our government is distributing them. So it's all very different and what people hear from one state may not be in the next state. And I think sometimes when they write or call us, they're kind of frustrated and upset because they don't understand why it looks like that on TV and it's not here. As I alluded to earlier, the other massive challenge that we had, or you guys had, I should say, but we're all involved in it, was the election this past year in 2020 in Pennsylvania having a new law for mail-in ballots. Mm -hmm. But the since the counties are in charge basically of that, um, could you tell me a little bit uh, about that process and what it was like kind of just being, you know, I guess it's trial by fire at that point, but that yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But uh, just a little bit more about the mail-in ballot process. Uh, obviously, these are going to be something that continue in the future, but so something that you learned this year and can be carried forward for the for future elections. Bob should answer this as because he was chair, but also because, uh, I mean, you came in as a new commissioner and were handed the board of elections and all of oh, this man. and... Yeah, um, you know, it's there were a lot of challenges, as you said. <clears throat> the one that people forget about was the fact that the county also last year rolled out brand new voting machines. And the Board of Elections, even before I took office uh, and before last January, the Board of Elections staff had already put together a really comprehensive, well thought out, well planned schedule of public demonstrations of these machines. They knew where they were going all over the county, set dates, they had everything ready to go. Time, everything was uh, documentation, you know, paperwork ready to give out to people, samples, and it was, and I, they had about three or four of those. And I went to them and they were really, really very well done because uh, everyone was very, very nervous about these new machines, how do they work, et cetera. But uh, they only got about three or four of them because everything else shut down. Mm -hmm. So now we have to educate in a presidential election year, we have to educate people about these brand new voting machines and how they work, and this is how you vote now, um, by video. Which, you know, the videos were, were good, but you know, they're obviously not as effective. Um, 
we also had to then explain to them Act 77, which was the new voting law, and we're learning it ourselves as it was sort of rolling out. There was a lot of the, the newness of it, of course, caused a tremendous amount of confusion, um, and there was a lot of information coming out from, from, from you know, well-meaning organizations that were giving information to people, sending it out, mailing it out, uh, that was causing a lot of confusion. Uh, and there's nothing we could do about that. You know, there was some organization out of Virginia, I think it was, that kept mailing absent ma mailing applications to people. I think I we got like four sets of them at my house. There's four voters in my house, and I kept getting them over and over and over again. And they had a return envelope, to, you could put it in for that was our address, county address. And we started getting all these complaints from people. Why is the county wasting this money sending out applications? Well, There's not us. <laughs> we didn't send them out. Right. We didn't ask for them to be sent out. They just sent them out thinking this was being helpful, and it wasn't. It wasn't right. sorry being helpful. Um, what really kind of the thing that really did also overlay all of this was the fact that we knew we're in a swing state, but we are a swing county in that swing state. We're the biggest county that you could argue was up for grabs. You know, Philadelphia, Allegheny, Monco, everybody knew how they were going in this election. Um, but, you know, we were more of a wild card. And that brought a lot of attention to us. You know, international attention and national media attention, but we also were very cognizant early, early on that it was also going to make us a lightning rod if anything went wrong. And so we had to dot every I, cross every T, to make sure that everything we did could withstand a legal challenge, which we knew we were going to get. Uh, and we were sued many times over how we conducted the election. Um, Jessica Vanderkam uh, uh, was the person who led that fight. She won every court case uh, in terms of, uh, which is a testament to her, but also the way our staff had handled themselves that, you know, the, you know it was Trump zero, and I forget what our total was, but we, uh, you know, we, wow. we, won, yeah, we won every case. Um, but that was something else that every decision we made, we had to think about how could this be turned on us, you know, if the election goes a certain way. And how do we prevent that from happening while still protecting people's right to vote, making it easy to vote, following the law? I mean, that's a great testament to like the strength of local government, especially the county government, uh, just to to have that. You have that the test of being all these lawsuits and everything thrown at you at once, and it still like withholds that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it is a testament to just the strength of the integrity of our elections. Um, the moving forward from there. One thing that you know I find personally interesting, or uh, I don't know, I guess maybe not interesting is not the right word, but a challenge is young people in in Bucks County. Um, obviously, I'm I'm young, I'm 24, so finding housing, finding um, affordable housing and uh, college, and you know the list goes on of of for young people. Um, this is kind of a this two part question. How do you attract? young people to, to Bucks County, and how do we get them to stay? <laughs> we need to give them a house so they can stay, or an affordable apartment. That, that is certainly one of the biggest challenges we face. So, and so many people leave Bucks County, they go to work in Philadelphia or Montgomery County, so providing people with a job that pays a wage that they can buy a house for here is, is critical. Um, we have not had a lot of ability to work on that this year because of the pandemic, but that is, that's a huge, Huge thing. One of the goals we came in, again, something that came out of the transition report, was the county has several different economic development agencies that handle different things. But, uh, and I kind of saw this as a township supervisor in the falls, that, that you almost didn't know who they were and what's the interaction between these two. And, and you know, is, is this one, are they playing nice, <laughs> you know, with each other? Are they working on the same kind of goal or are they just sort of doing their own thing? And so um, we wanted to, to come in and change how that functioned. And we've started that process. We brought the uh, workforce development program into the county. Uh, that is something that helps train people for jobs. It helps connect employers with people looking for jobs. So it doesn't have to be someone who's looking for work. It could be an employer who's saying, gee, I need people to fill this kind of role. And then they make those connections. It helps with job training. Um, and so bringing them in and, and starting the process of having these agencies work more collaboratively which we think is going to benefit employers in terms of attract and getting finding workers, but also people looking for work and also help make us more attractive for businesses to come here and set up shop. 
uh, and provide those jobs. But the housing is key. Uh, you know, when we, certainly we've there's been a lot of housing development, obviously, over the past couple of decades. Uh, Doylestown Township's population has changed dramatically over the past 30, 40 years, as a lot of Bucks County has. Uh, but how do we incorporate, um, you know, housing there for people like yourself, you know, who are coming in, you know, young professionals and, and people, you know, who are starting out um, making, you know, a, a good salary, uh, but just can't find anywhere, you know, that, that's affordable for them. And there's another uh, aspect that it doesn't necessarily just hit at young people. But I know uh, disproportionately uh, people that have been affected by it in my age is the op opioid uh, epidemic. Um, how is Bucks County addressing that? Uh, I know that's something that we haven't really hit on today, but it is something that is a major issue for the county. And you know, I've, I know people that have died from, from opioid usage um, that are my age. So how is the county addressing that? To start with, we, we, our Drug and Alcohol Commission has a big hand in that. They give out Narcan, so anybody who want, wants to have Narcan should have it. We have saved many people's lives, just people driving and seeing something, you know, and they stop and they've got this Narcan. I keep it in my glove compartment and in my pocketbook all the time. Could you could you just briefly explain what that is? Sure, I, sure. I know, what, I know what that is, but for a lot of people, like I, that was a recent thing that I had learned about. Could you just explain on? So it's a, Narcan is something that you just put a simple spray up the nostril of anybody who has passed out that you, if they did not pass out because of something related to opiates, nothing would happen. But if it did, it can bring them back. And that allows you time to get an ambulance to come and whatnot. Um, but just follow that up. The, the county has also started a program now where when that happens, we follow up with some with a peer who has made it through recovery to go to the hospital to meet people who have overdosed so that they have someone who can help them walk through the process of getting treatment. Um, we are trying to make sure that there's no wrong door and that everybody is getting treatment. Obamacare has really helped people to be able to have access to the insurance for treatment, but the county sometimes has to pick up those first few days or weeks before Obamacare kind of stuff, you know, kicks in. Um, so, so we're doing all of that. Right before Bob got here, you know, I was able to start a drug and alcohol program in our jail, which we never had. But even right now, it's been limited to 50 men and 20 women. So, you know, once the pandemic is over and we are having more of a normal experience in the prison, we'll be able to go back to giving, you know, more assistance with substance abuse. This is something, I mean, the county deals, if it wasn't for the pandemic, it's one of the high priorities that the county has. Diane has, of course, been working this for a long time and, and I you know, should also point out, uh, you know, that the Republican commissioner, uh, Commissioner DiGiralamo, um, his family has been affected uh, by, you know, by, by uh, drug abuse uh, issues. And so he's very, very, very much a proponent of, doing, of re really sort of, you know, the three of us are really in lockstep on that. Uh, so that's been great. Um, but we also have joined in um, class action lawsuit against opioid manufacturers as a county, uh, looking to make sure that they pay for the damage that they've done, uh, you know, to our community and communities across the country. Yeah, and uh, they, this kind of dovetails nicely with the uh, the previous two interviews in which we talk about unification and maybe maybe now is not exactly the greatest time for unification. We've had all this this turmoil, but uh, issues like the opioid epidemic really do ha see no party, no, like I said, it, it affects young people, it affects old people, it affects everyone in between. Um, so that's, I, I'm, that was a great, great um, illustrative answer for, for our viewers because the opioid epidemic, like you said, is something that would be the top question if it wasn't for all of the crazy stuff that's happened in the last year. It's, touched, it's virtually touched everybody. We yeah. have grandparents raising children, grandchildren. Um, in the beginning of this opioid thing, everybody thought, oh, it won't happen in my neighborhood. It's happened in everyone's neighborhood. This is a question that I ask everybody, but... Uh, this is the Vote Local interview series. So we've obviously learned a lot about the Bucks County government, but what is, you know, the, what is the next uh, best reason other than just say like, you know, you can get great elected people like you. Um, what, what is the most important reason to vote local and get involved locally? This is where everything happens, right? Yeah. You know, I think we talk about, and, and you know, there are, there are multiple levels to this, as you said. You know, certainly you want your elected officials to do everything in their power to make their communities better. 
Uh, and that's kind of what I was raised very much in a, in a family that believed that. I got involved very early because I just saw aunts and uncles and my mom and dad that were very involved in things because not for political reasons necessarily, but just because they wanted to make things better, whether it was community, school, whatever it was. Um, and one of the, I guess, the philosophical change that we've seen, and I know you're going to sort of ask this question later on about Democrats in office, but philosophically, we as Democrats believe that your county government should be actively serving you. Uh, and so many, we heard this from the people who were elected in 2017, the Democrats who took office, um, that they kept hearing, well, that's not the way we do things here. Because for so long, for 30 years, for you know, the majority of the history of this county, Republican Party controlled things. And if it wasn't broke, they didn't fix it. And even if it was broke, they didn't fix it. <laughs> you know, they just kind of let, you know, let things go, let things go, and, you know, whatever. Uh, and we came in and thinking, no, 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 there are areas where we need to be actively involved. And so in Doyle's Tempero, which of course, you know, is, you know, they've obviously changed things over the past couple of decades and, and things have been, you know, far different than they were. But in the township, is Doylestown Township or any other borough or township, is your government really doing everything they could do? Uh, and I think Democrats instinctively want government to be active. They see government, uh, us, uh, you know, we're servants of the people you know, who elected us. And if people didn't elect us, we're servants of them too. We should be actively trying to help them. So I think that's a, that's a big philosophical change, you know, is... is and we, that's kind of the big thing that's happened in the county level. I think it, you know, we're, people have noticed that early on. We came in and started saying, all right, we're going to do this, 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 this. And we're like, oh, we don't usually do those things. Don't care. We're doing them now. <laughs> you, know? you know, one of the things that we've been able to accomplish recently goes to show how important voting for people in a local office is. We have started a new program in Ben Salem where there are co-responders. They're basically social workers who are going out with the police on calls that really need social workers, not a police. Could be somebody having a mental illness and they're having kind of a, a rough time. It could be an aging parent who, who is struggling. They're keeping, they keep calling the police because they need help, but they really need a social worker. So, you know, we've gone ahead and said, all right, let's try it. Let's, you know, there's pilot money out there. We're willing to do it. Let's find a police department who will try it. We'd now like to expand it to other police departments. That's why voting local is so important because we can actually do stuff that'll change it. You know, we need to have a mental health court in this county and that's something we're hoping to accomplish this year. People with mental illness should not end up in jail because there's nowhere else for them to go. We get to actually work on that. So you wanna vote for people who are gonna make the concrete changes in your community that you can see. Well, I mean, those are both great answers, and and it does say why you know having a Democrat in, in your position is important as well, because we do have certain values that put forth solutions to certain issues in a certain way. Um, my last question for you guys is, uh, if people want to get involved more, and you know, obviously voting is what we ask them from this interview series, but if they want to get involved more with the county, whether that be through the government or through another vehicle. What, what should they do? So there's boards and commissions that we have that we make appointments to. You can go right on the website and there's a form there. It's a very simple application. See what you're interested in. That, that can be very helpful. Yeah. And, and I would also add just, again, coming from the election side of things, one of the things we did notice was an issue in this past election. Um, and COVID probably played a small role in this, not as big a role as it played in the spring, but probably a small one. People working in the polls on election day. You know, the actual poll workers themselves, you know, the judges of elections, the machine operators, the inspectors, the clerks. Um, we saw, you know, in many cases, the people that, we, that were working, you know, could be working very, very hard. But especially with new machinery, they may not have been as adept at working with it. Um, you know, we need people who are there, in, you know, twice a year, basically, uh, to help those elections run smoothly. I think we know that some of the lines that we saw on election day were simply because a lot of people showed up to vote. But some of the lines were also because, because the people inside you know, weren't working maybe as efficiently as they needed to. Um, and, then, and so we're, we are going to be looking actively and asking you know, all the political parties, really, even both parties, but especially in, obviously on our side, um, start asking for people that want to work that day. You get paid. It is obviously a long day. Um, the good news is 2021, you know, you're going to have a smaller turnout of people. It shouldn't have the same sort of level of vitriol that we saw last year, we hope, uh, because it's local elections. Not that they're not important, but, 
you know, we need people to work inside the polls as well. So that's something that you could do um, in addition to looking for boards and, and even the boards and, and uh, commissions. There, obviously, Doylestown Borough has those, Doylestown Township has those, and they're usually looking for people to serve on those. So there's a lot of things you can do to get involved. Well, thank you guys both for your great answers for this, uh, for this interview. And it's very, very enlightening to see all these answers. And you can also find uh, the county meetings on your website and on Facebook, correct? Yep. Yeah, yep. so that's new to us. That didn't happen before um, we were the majority in Bucks County, so. Yeah, so for those watching, if you guys would like to watch the county government meetings live, you can definitely do so, and they'll be on Facebook, which is awesome. That's how I watch them. But um, thank you guys once again for joining us today, and um, for those watching, if you want to sign up for our Zoom live uh Doylestown Democrats Vote Local interview series where you can do Q&As and et cetera. Go to the, the description link down below to the Doylestown Democrats website. You can sign up for any future uh, interview series. And if you wanna go check out the past interviews, you can go right on our YouTube channel and you can find all of the previous interviews uh, right there. So thank you again, Diane, Bob, and thank you to Koru Real Wellness for hosting us today and, ho and helping us shoot this. So thank you very much. And if you feel so inclined and you wanna support the Vote Local interview series, please go and give us a donation to make this all of this possible where we get to rent out this space and get our county officials here and get everybody in here and uh, shoot something that will actually help educate people about local government. So thank you again, and I hope to see you at our next Zoom interview. Well, welcome back to the live portion of our Vote Local interview with Commissioner Marseglia and Commissioner Harvey. Thank you too so much for going to the studio for the pre-recorded session and being with us tonight. Um, we have a full uh, array of questions lined up for you and we have about 30 minutes allotted for that. And so we would wanna start right away. And so if you don't mind, we're gonna to try to um, keep your answers uh, short within one to two minutes so that we can squeeze in as many questions as we can. And our last questions will be asked around 8.10. Okay, so the first question, and I just wanna preface this, this is not a COVID town hall. I know you two have probably been bombarded with COVID questions. So we just wanna give you a few minutes to just give us an update, a quick update. Uh, Bob, do you wanna go first? Uh, yeah, I can start. So, um, you know, obviously the, the pandemic, our first case um, here in Bucks County was last March. The first cases, I should say. Um, you know, we are uh, about 39,000 cases so far since then. Uh, I think the most recent death toll is 1,085, I believe uh, is the death toll. Um, what we have seen over the past few weeks is definitely a decline in cases. Um, even that, that holiday surge, uh, the surge that really started before the holiday, started really in, in October and continued through December that was across the nation, uh, did uh, obviously have an impact here. Uh, we did see a surge. The good news was that our hospitals really never came close to seeing the kind of numbers that they saw in the spring. Um, you know, we were seeing really, really, uh, you know, some scary numbers coming out of the spring in terms of, of hospital beds being used and ventilators being used. Uh, we never even came close to those numbers uh, this time. Um, and so that's obviously a good thing. Um, the vaccinations, we started yesterday with three mass sites. Uh, you know, as, uh, as we know uh, here in Bucks and in Montco and in Chester County, there were problems um, on, in all the counties with people sharing links, uh, with systems not quite operating the way they were supposed to. I think Monco's system crashed actually uh, when they were doing their, their registration part. We actually did uh, vaccinate about a thousand people yesterday. Uh, so we're proud of that. We are getting about 5,000 doses a week uh, of vaccine. So uh, we have those clinics open you know, five days a week. So doing about a thousand uh, you know, a day obviously is, is what we're able to do. They will be closed tomorrow because of the weather. Uh, so those appointments are moved to Sunday, I believe. And those people have all been notified of that. So I don't know if Diane wants to add anything. Just, just that, you know, if anybody asks anybody about it, to extend the fact that we just need to be a little more patient, it really is about supply. 
I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why it was taking so long. And finally, someone gave me an article the other day that I'm hoping they're going to put in the newspaper soon. It takes 110 days to make a batch of the doses of vaccine. And we are now working on the doses that were made back in October. So it is going to take a while to ramp up. This isn't easy. And, you know, we are constantly advocating. Bob is on a call with the other counties all the time. The other counties are always asking. It's a bipartisan approach, even with the state reps. It's just not here. So if the supply isn't here, we can't really move any faster than when it gets here. Right. Well, thank you. I, yes, I think the supply is a critical um, factor and it's sort of out of the county's control, right? So, but so thank you all. Thank you both for working so hard on that front for us. Um, we're going to switch to a different topic. As Judy mentioned in the very beginning, uh, when we started this series, we look at the borough, we look at the township, we look at all the government entity, we start with the budget because budget is sort of like a value uh, document in terms of where we're putting our resources, where we, we are investing. So um, when we look at the, the county budget and we realize that a lot of the line item stays the same because year after year, you pretty much, as Diane, you mentioned that a lot of things you have to do, right? So, so we're just scanning through it and we're looking at some of the issues, uh, some of the items. And actually we found um, a couple of things that are very interesting in, uh, to us. One is that we saw that there is an increase in the voter uh, registration and board of election um, line item. And as Bob, you mentioned that uh, Bucks County is a swing county in a swing state. And we eked out an 18,000 vote victory for Biden. And, um, and a lot of that is uh, on the heel of our mail-in ballot uh, initiatives. I think Democrats had 110,000 mail-in ballot application where 90% of us re return our ballot and the Republicans had about 50,000. So uh, in your opinion, uh, do we, does the county still want to continue to push for, well, not that you were pushing, but do you want to encourage people to do mail-in ballot versus in person? And um, how do you plan to make any changes in terms of um, the added funding if you're, you know, adding capacity or however? So would you uh, share that information with us? Um, I, I guess, Bob, you've been in charge of this uh, mail-in ballot initiative. So do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, one of the things we've, we've talked to the state about, um, I was at a, um, a Democratic, uh, state house Democratic policy hearing a few weeks ago. Um, one of the state reps, Perry Warren, actually, state rep here from Bucks County was, was part of that committee. Um, the mail-in ballot law, Act 77, which was bipartisan, don't let anybody tell you that it wasn't bipartisan because it was passed by a Republican controlled legislature and signed by a Democratic governor. Um, so this idea that Democrats instituted mail-in voting was, is, you know, it's completely false. Um, it, it was, it's a good law. It had, definitely has flaws as we learned uh, sort of the hard way. One of the things though is it is in many ways an unfunded mandate. Um, it does require the counties as uh, boards of election to mail out a lot of paper uh, print a lot of paper, um, uh, you know, all the envelopes, uh, scanning, um, you know, it, it is uh, in the machinery that we bought to help process all of that um, was certainly something that wasn't, that we did get some grants from the state and we'll continue to get some grant money, I think, from the state, a small amount that we got federal grant money as well, which helped. Um, Mail-in voting, I think, is, you know, it's really here to stay and I think should be. Uh, most of the states in the country have mail-in voting. Uh, we know it can be done safely. We know it can be done successfully. Uh, if we could carry out last year's election um, in a pandemic, uh, brand new machines, brand new voting system, brand new voting law that confused a lot of people. Uh, and in a presidential year, especially that presidential year, uh, if we could carry that out successfully, then, then we've really you know, run the gauntlet of, of the most difficult election probably anybody's ever had to run. Uh, so I'm very confident that we'll continue to do that. Uh, people have gotten just recently in the past couple of weeks, you've gotten a permanent mail-in application. If you filed for to be a permanent mail-in voter last year, uh, you would have received in the mail a permanent uh, application. This is a state law. We have to send that application out every February to anybody who 
the year before checked the box to be a permanent mail-in voter. Um, Act 77 does not make permanent mail-in voting permanent. So it's basically permanent for that year. And then you have to basically reapply the next year. It can be done online. You don't have to do the paper if you don't want to. Um, but that means we have to actually have our staff re-enter everybody's information over again, just like they did last year. So it's one of the one of the flaws in the system, I think, that could be changed. Uh, I think people should be allowed to be permanent, meaning actually permanent, um, you know, and not have to reapply every year, not have the county have to pay to mail those applications out and then process everything that comes in and, and the system starts all over again. Diane, Diane. Diane. I don't know that I have a whole lot new to offer. The only thing I would just say is that it's always a little bit tricky when you're serving on the Board of Elections because while, while we may be Democrats, we serve all of the voters, no matter what party you are, and we want to encourage everybody to vote. So we, can't really, we don't really look at it with our political hats on. But, you know, I also don't always think you can look at our budget and say how much it speaks to, or it's not like Bob and I decided, let's go put $2 million more million or something in the Board of Elections. It's because of the laws and the changes. So we, we had to step up and do what we had to do. And, and it's, you're gonna continue to see it have more money because it costs more to do, do it this way of voting, although it is getting more people to vote. So that's good. Okay. Um, actually, uh, Lisa McCauley uh, in the audience had posed a question and asking um, the county government, how are you going to ensure to protect the fair and free election going forward? Um, so I, I, so from, from Bob, your answer and, and, and Diane, you're saying that this is, a, this is a nonpartisan thing. This is to protect people's vote regardless of party, party affiliation. Right. So, uh, so I think mm -hmm. we're in we're in good hands because we are so happy that that the two of you are in charge of our board of election <laughs> in 2020. Thank um, you. Okay. So the next question um, is, uh, Carl, if you can advance to the next slide. This this is um, something that we, we thought very curious. Uh, also, since we have the two of you, we thought we asked you because as as you're talking about. Um, the role officers are elected, but you really control their budget, so to speak. So as we're scanning through this, I, it just popped out at us saying, wow, look at the coroner's budget. It got slashed by two thirds. So um, is, was this a mistake or is it just happened to be, there's something that's going on with the coroner's office that we don't need it anymore? Or, I mean, we thought that since you were here, we could ask you this question. <laughs> Uh, we're probably always going to need a coroner's office. I, I don't okay. think that's going to stop, especially okay. with COVID. It's probably a better question to, to ask the coroner. Oh, okay. Um, does the coroner, I mean, I thought you folks are in charge of allocating the budget, right? Is that true? Okay. So there's, so there's something more to this than what we're looking at. Is that what you're saying? I would just say that it's kind of complicated and I don't, this is probably not the time you want to get into that. Question. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. So well, I did, I did get a question um, mm -hmm. that um, came in, uh, in terms of the uh, expanding the mental health services, uh, Diane, as you had talked about it, the pilot program in Van Salem's just sounds like a wonderful thing. And it's mm -hmm. something that we're seeing nationwide. Um, and you, you said that um, that could be expanded to other police departments. How would a municipal police department get, get onto that program? How could they get some of that pilot money so, to make that happen? So it's a pilot program. It only pays for that program for the next two years. We do have someone who's involved, uh, Patty Griffin from Holy Family University, who does studies on that. So she is week by week compiling the statistics. The goal is that after the two years are done, we're going to be able to show that police department that, hey, this saved you money. By having this, you were, there were two less police officers you needed to hire. And then they have agreed that they will hire the people. They'll go ahead and take them out of their budget because it will have proved the point that, you know, by having those social workers, it saved police officers all that time that they are normally on the streets dealing with mental health issues. So then you could go ahead and expand it for another township one at a time. We do have our grant officer right now looking for grants on this, so we would go faster. Um, if there's a township who has the money they want to put into this, we will back it. We can hire people and supervise them, but we don't necessarily have the money yet to do this. My gut is you are going to see lots and lots of money start to appear for this. And the project in Ben Salem 
because it's it is really doing well. What I've been hearing is that they are the police are thrilled with the response they have. We will go ahead and keep rolling it out. But the police chiefs also from the various municipalities and townships also have to be willing to want to yes. go, go to that program, right? So that's also an important component is that the police in the townships also have to be right. willing. Right, and I know I was speaking program. to Falls Township's chief the other night and Bob knows they were very interested. I think they just added some people onto their police department who will respond to drug crises. So that is kind of a direction police offices, police, police, state, police departments are moving. Mm -hmm. That's great development. Thank you. Great. So um, the, uh, the next question is uh, as to follow up on the pre-recorded portion, when Connor was uh, discussing with you folks about the planning commission and we're just realizing how important the planning commission is in terms of charting the future of Bucks County in terms of land use, in terms of future potential development. And I'm sure it was, uh, it has a lot to do with the open space program, the successful open space program of Bucks County. So, um, and we're, we're, as you suggested that for people who are interested in volunteering to help uh, participate in the county work, they can join a lot of these commissions. So looking at the planning commission, so what kind of qualifications are you looking for people to, if they want to participate, um, you know, do they need to have business development or what would you suggest? Like you don't want anybody and everybody to come and apply to be on the planning commission. So are, do you have some ideas as to the kind of people that you're looking for? I don't know if Bob has more to say, but I would say that first of all, you're usually drawn to the commission you want to serve on. So mm -hmm. I, I have a feeling like as a social worker, it wasn't really something I was real interested in, but you know, typically if, I mean, we're interested in anyone, but people who are interested in land development, zoning laws, agricultural issues, um, th those are the kind of people that we want. Bob, I don't know if you want to add anything. And, and I think that it's important to sort of uh, to draw a distinction, you know, uh, boroughs and townships have planning commissions, which is, and I was actually on the one in Falls Township, where it's, you know, five or seven member boards who review plans that come in and make recommendations to the board or the supervisors before those plans go on. At the county level, the planning commission is really different. And you do have the, the volunteer board uh, of people uh, that provide some, some overall direction, but there is a full-time full staff uh, okay. in the planning commission uh, who are county employees mm -hmm. and they are doing work every single day. In fact, a lot of the work you see being done and you've seen being done since last March on the uh, website, uh, the COVID portal with all the statistics, uh, the graphics, the maps of the county that, that show the vaccine location or uh, you know information testing locations. All of that was done by uh, our GIS specialists in the planning commission. In addition to doing things like uh, surveying um, preserved farmland uh, and making sure that the that people are staying up on what they're supposed to be doing uh, mm -hmm. with that, right. um, as well as doing things, planning out parks and, and the trails, the Upper Bucks Trail that just got done. There's one now being planned for a dark hollow uh, that's, that's in the process of getting worked on. Uh, that's all planning commission as well. Great. Um, as you foresee, looking at um, going forward in Bucks County, what do you see are some of the major um, inflection points? It's like, is it demographic? Is it growth or is it no growth or very little growth? Or what do you see in terms of as a county government areas that you may need to um, reapportion, readjust your resources? You know, you know um, I think everybody right now, the, the issue to deal with is mental health and drug addiction okay. and trying to get communities to get along with one another and issues of cultural and racial awareness. But uh -huh. today, and Bob can talk a little bit about this, you know, I think climate change, once COVID's over, working on the issues to, that the effects of global warming, we need to really dig in on that. Mm -hmm. we, we really haven't been able to do a whole lot for it this year. So I think that, and I think too, uh, working on inclusionary zoning and different kind of options that allow us to have different housing for different kind of jobs for different incomes throughout the county, rather than just in a few, you know, few, to, few townships have that available everywhere. And it's, and I'll actually combine the, the, the question you just asked Bonnie with the one you asked before, because um, as we speak, uh, well, not right now, because people are, aren't working right now, but uh, our planning commission is working uh, with uh, Eric Nagy, who is our director of policy and, and, and planning, 
on um, a survey that's gonna be going out uh, to county residents uh, to help build our comprehensive plan. Uh, you know, the census information, which we will have more of, uh, have, have our, uh, be able to get some details on later on this year. Uh, we're going to use that information combined with uh, this survey that's going to go out to hundreds of families. Uh, it's a phone survey, hundreds of families all over. It's a professional organization that we've hired that's going to be doing this survey. And they're going to be asking questions like the ones you've just asked about what people want to see for the future of this county when it comes to things like uh, recreation when it comes to things like housing and economic development uh, and infrastructure. Uh, and we're going to use that information plus the census uh, to help guide the next you know, decade uh, of Bucks County's future. Okay, great. Um, Judy, um, I, um, I don't know if you're going to ask, um, I think um, Hadley Little had asked about a recycle question. Um, she has submitted this question beforehand. And in the beginning, we thought recycling is pretty much a township borough kind of issue, right? So, um, but at the county level, as you talked about looking at the climate change, um, so do you folks think that there's something that at the county level you can provide some leadership? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, in Great. fact, uh, we've been working for a couple of months now trying to, what we're trying to do is, um, the, you probably know the county does house, household hazardous waste collections three times a year. Okay. Uh, one in the upper part of the county, lower part of the county, uh, or lower central and upper part of the counties uh, for people that need to get rid of things that, you know, oil-based paints and car batteries and things like that. They just want to get out of the house. But we know that there is a problem with uh, recycling electronics, uh, e-waste. Uh, so that is an issue. Uh, I, I actually helped run an or, uh, a plan in Fall, or a uh, operation in Falls Township uh, through the township government. We offered free uh, e-recycling uh, several couple of years ago, and it, it was uh, I, I was going to say it was successful to the point where it was almost a disaster because we had cars lined up for miles in different directions that we just hadn't anticipated. Uh, and we know that's an issue in the county. So we're looking for ways to, to implement some kind of an e-waste program in Bucks County uh, that would be free to county residents. We're hoping to make it free to county residents. We're looking for vendors right now that uh, would be interested in, in working with us to set up uh, different ways and talking to some other counties that have similar operations, just trying to, trying to feel out how we move forward with that. Yeah, that sounds like a, a wonderful program to have. I mean, everybody has way too many cell phones and way too many electronics. Yeah. Um, um, Bob, one of the other things that you mentioned um, during the recorded session uh, was that it wasn't outside agencies that were sending so many applications for mail-in ballots. As a committee person, I had so many people come up to me thinking that there was some kind of fraud going on because yeah. they kept, people kept getting mail-in ballots and they were already registered to vote. So I just wanted to reiterate again, they were outside agencies and not the county that was sending all those, just trying to be helping hands um, yeah. and, and doing that. So um, that, was, that was great to hear. Um, and I had a question about the, the mental health court. I, I think that's a fabulous idea. Could you kind of describe what that looks like? I know if I did something criminal, I'd have to go to jail or I'd get a ticket or I'd get a fine. What does mental health court look like? So first of all, we have been trying, or I've been trying for years and years, and this is a good example of how, wow, when you're in the majority, all of a sudden some doors start to open. But it does require the court system and the district attorney to work along with us because the district attorney has to agree to the mental health court for anyone. And there has to be a judge who's willing to run it. And the president judge has to be willing to say, you know, it can be in this county, but it runs just like drug court. So if somebody was acting out and they are arrested and the police don't know what to do with them, so they may arrest them because they don't know, there's no place to take them. They're not quite ill enough to be taken to a hospital. So they can charge them and then they can go to mental health court. And when they go to mental health court, instead of jail, the judge will say to them, okay, here's the things I want you to do. I wanna see that you're taking your medication every day. I wanna hear from your therapist you're there every day. I want you to go and do 10 hours of volunteer work, um, all kinds of ideas like that. And then they have a probation officer and they'll have a caseworker. And they're very intensely involved. Usually they go back to the court once a week to report on how they're doing. As a matter of fact, drug court is gonna be held tomorrow even there, though there's gonna be snow. So they form a relationship, not just with their PO and the case manager, but even with the judge. And that level of involvement is what usually people needed all along. 
I actually went with one of the judges the other day to look at a potential even recovery house because she was aware, the judge that may handle this, she may have people come in front of her who, who are also homeless and they may need to stay somewhere. Back when Ronald Reagan was here, he you know, started that process of closing all the hospitals, which, you know, mental hospitals, which was a, a good idea at the time, but he had no plan. So we are still trying to recover from that. And so a recovery house for people who, who maybe are homeless, have a mental illness, can go there and the judge actually went with me. We went to look at it together to make sure that it was gonna be okay. So that's and, how the mental health court works. And then your charges are dropped when you do all of that because uh, the committee agreed your charges are dropped. That's wonderful. We, we just saw um, all the counseling, which is right here in Doylestown, they're closing. What's, can, do you have any, do you have any background on that? I don't think they're that? closing. They just stopped part of their contract. Um, with the with county? Some of the medication assisted treatment they were doing and, and contracts with the county. But I think they're staying open. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I know that's been a passion of Diane. So I'm so glad that you're able to exercise what you uh, really know best. Um, one question that came from um, the, the audience, Elizabeth Bishop is asking, uh, follow up in terms of the affordable housing, how much uh, control does the county have over affordable housing? Depends on how much control we want to have over it. I suppose. Okay. We can, you know, there's this thing called inclusionary zoning and we can try to get out there and work with townships on, on including some part of every development that goes up from now on to have some housing that is affordable. So we can get more aggressively involved. We can have an incentive program for that. Last year, Bob went out and talked to every single borough and township government. And I think that's part of your foot in the door. Because of COVID, we've been having like monthly meetings like by Zoom with every township manager. So we need to start to approach those ideas. I think people like you who go ahead and, and will support their the township supervisors when that comes up is helpful. Um, Bob? Yeah, I mean, the zoning is is a borough and township matter, ultimately. Uh, you know, counties in Pennsylvania can't, uh, well, these counties like us in Pennsylvania can't pass zoning laws. But what we can do is try to encourage uh, the 54 municipalities uh, to adopt zoning practices that we think would make sense. And we actually just did this, uh, we're, we're doing this, I should say, right now. Um, only about half of the count, half of the municipalities in the county have anything in their zoning ordinances about alternative energy, solar panels, wind, geothermal, whatever. Um, and so, uh, and knowing from my experience as a supervisor that having your zoning, having a major section of your zoning law written is, can be expensive because uh, you're hiring an attorney to do all the research and write all that. And, and so what I asked our planning commission to do was to write it for everybody else. And so our planning commission has written a model alternative energy ordinance mm -hmm. um, that it covers residential commercial properties. This is not for somebody who wants to come in and build a, you know, a, a, a hundred acre solar panel you know, field. That's not what this is for. This is more about some developer comes in, wants to build, whether it's commercial properties or you know, shopping centers or houses, um, or if someone wants to you know, put solar panels on their home or put a geothermal system in, um, this is a zoning ordinance that outlines how that can be done, uh, ways, you know, best practices. Uh, it also includes incentives. So uh, for example, a, a municipality could uh, offer to give a deduction on the permit fees. If a developer is coming in and is gonna dedicate X percent of the energy in my development is gonna be, you know, some kind of alternative energy. It's gonna be solar panels, it's gonna be geothermal. Um, you know, and it's really up to the local municipalities how they want to adopt it. They can change parts of it. They can adopt. We'd like to, to adopt as much of it as, as we, as we, you know, as they can, because we really do think it's something that is helpful. Uh, I know Falls Township, for example, has um, a, a solar energy part of their ordinance. I know because I was there <laughs> when we passed it, but it, it was a while ago. So it needs to be updated. This would replace that. Um, and I've been talking to some local elected officials and we've sent it out to every municipality. Uh, every manager has it. Uh, and so for the people on this call, uh, you certainly can reach out to your elected officials, no matter what township you're in or borough and, and check in with them uh, and say, you know, did you, did you get this? I mean, do you have this? I mean, how, how are we on, on adopting this? Because we've done the heavy lifting. You know, we actually wrote the ordinance. So if they can tinker with it, obviously, and, and change some things if they want, that's their ordinance but most of the heavy lifting is done. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that counties can do 
is is you know create that using our resources and then just give it out to anybody who wants to use it. Okay, great, Bob. Um, even though it's eight ten, I said we're going to ask you the last question. I just saw Krista Erickson had asked uh, two questions and. She's talking about the medical transportation, especially I think the issues in Upper Buck. She says zone as suburban, not rural. So it lacks transportation assistance. Are you aware of that? And can you expand on this? So I'm thinking you're talking about medical transportation. So like the um, Correct. TMA, the Bucks County trans, transit and things. Right. You know, it is, it is bad. In the lower part of the county, because of the population in most areas, we have to use SEPTA. So we're not allowed to use that. So that's got its own set of problems with it. Okay. I do think that it's a problem. It is something that we'd like to work on, but it's less about what's happening with the transportation company that, that has that and more about the state. They need to give us more room. They need to give more money. They need to, uh, because we don't, we can't raise the money for it. So that's the problem. Um, our mental health people go in there every single year trying to get more transport. Our um, I, our developmental disabilities people go in every year trying to get more money. I think it comes up again soon, so they will be able to request greater grants. Uh -huh. But it's very difficult. And this is a big county, so when they start driving people around, you know, it, it, money doesn't go very far. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so okay. advocate with your state rep, state senator, yeah. um, you know, to, to make sure they're aware of it when it comes time for, okay. for budgeting. But it's, it is a really important issue. Okay, great. All right, so um, so here comes the last question. It's very open-ended. So um, what are your 2021 top priorities, knowing that you have still have COVID on your hands and you have all these other issues? So if you have one or two things that you think that you wanna focus on, what can you share them with us? Uh, Diane, why don't you go first? I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> it's like, you know, which one do you want most of all? Right, right. I want that mental health court Okay. We are also opening sort of a forensic unit, not for people to be in the jail, but for that person that I, I told you about that maybe was arrested by the police, but they can't be released because they're really not well right then. We're going to have a temporary respite area that, that we are putting together that could put 15 people in it, mm -hmm. hoping to get that done sometime in the summer. So between that and the mental health court, um, that, those are really big things for me this year. And, and watching us, and I know this is really, Bob has the lead on this, but I'm really into getting on the, the global warming issue and trying to start to focus on that. Right. Yeah, we're, it's kind of, we're kind of laughing because over the, over the, you know, I guess the month of January and December, uh, we were putting together a list of goals uh, for 2021. And I think it went to about, you know, two pages. Uh, a bulletin of all the things that we have in mind. And, and we actually accomplished a tremendous amount last year. We're really happy about the things that we did in spite of COVID uh, and the election. Uh, and I know that the, uh, I know that there has been a lot of social media, you know, kind of posts about things that, that, that have been accomplished in the past uh, two years uh, with this board. Um, we, we rolled out a few things today. We adopted the Sierra Clubs Ready for 100 as a county. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of counties in Pennsylvania that have adopted that. We adopted that today. We're in the process of working with counties around us on a major uh, solar power facility um, you know, project. Uh, that would be one of the, the only one of its kind almost. Uh, pretty much, it's pretty much brand new for this country uh, in terms of the way we're trying to work it. So we're happy about that. Um, we are working on uh, doing a lot of things in terms of helping our staff. Um, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was make directions clear. Anytime you're a leader, you have to make sure that the people you're leading know where you want them to go and they have the resources they need to get there uh, and to guide them along the way. So we are working on a, essentially what my teacher, you know, uh, you know verbiage, uh, mm -hmm. professional development programs for employees in the county, uh, department by department and, and tasking people with uh, our IT department, our HR department, our law department with uh, putting together seminars for our staff about anything from uh, right to no requests to uh, new software, um, implementing uh, some, some best management practices we think for our staff to help them. Um, and I think those are some of the things I mean, we wanna keep working on, on getting messaging out. Um, you know, the county you know, wasn't always uh, you know, adept at putting out its messaging. Uh, and so right now our public information department has two people in it uh, and that's for the whole county. Uh, and so that, that obviously is something that, that we need to change, try to get more present on social media. Our website will be changing uh, dramatically 
uh, coming up. It's been, it's been changing dramatically, but uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes as we speak uh, that'll that'll be a kind of really groundbreaking in terms of this county and, and lurching into the 21st century. Uh, you know, a couple of decades late, but uh, but it's really some some important stuff that's happening that we are really excited about. Can I just add real quick? One thing that came out, this is one of the blessings of COVID again, is we started to be able to get the courts to use electronic hearings. That has been a huge, huge saving of money because we are not toting prisoners all yeah, around yeah. all the time. Yeah. And it's allowed hearings to happen right in the jail. And I think everybody on here ought to also be aware, you know, the population of the jail is down because of mm -hmm. COVID and, and everything's doing okay. So I wonder sometimes if some people could be out on bail or there yeah. could be some alternative sentencing or things for people because it's yeah. kind of worked. And, and there's a reason besides human humanity of that, it saves a lot of money not having people locked up all the time because it's yeah. very expensive. Yeah. So they, if they can stay out with their families and have a job, it, it works for all of us. Oh, that's well, great. 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 Thank you so much, Diane and Bob. You know, we're so happy that you are the steward for Bucks County. And, um, and thank you for spending the time with us today and also being our tireless champion um, to help advance our, our common causes. So, um, Judy, um, I'm yep. turning this back to you. Thank you. Thank you. So hopefully you have learned a little bit more about Bucks County government and you enjoyed virtually meeting Diane and Bob. I know I did, it was really nice. Um, so what can you do next? Well, how do you get involved? Well, Bob had some great ideas. Diane had some great ideas for us. Uh, join one of the 35 boards and commissions run by the county. You can get an application online. They are from healthcare to land preservations. Uh, you can look it up on the county website. And then yes, do become a poll worker on election day. Actually, you'll meet all your neighbors when you do that. Uh, you can run for judge of election. You can run for majority and minority inspectors. They are paid positions. Uh, and uh, it's, it's good work to do uh, to help out uh, your local county. And uh, attend a Doylestown, a, a Doylestown Democratic meeting or any local municipality that you are live in, go to the Bucks County Democratic Committee website. There's a calendar on there and it's going to list all the Democratic meetings throughout the county. Um, volunteer with an activist group, whether it's Bucks County Voices or Rise Up Doylestown. There's so many great groups that you can meet your neighbors and get involved with. And the most important of all, vote. Uh, we do have a primary coming up May 18th. Uh, you'll pick your Democratic candidate, or if you're Republican, you'll pick your Republican candidates. And if you're going to your Democratic committee meetings, you're going to meet some of those candidates because they are making the rounds. Um, with Zoom, people from across the states uh, are making the rounds, and you'll be able to see them and get to know their platforms, and they'd love for you to hop on board. And then vote again in the general elections uh, for, uh, on November 2nd. So a special thanks again to Diane Marsegli and Bob Harvey. Thank you, uh, commissioners. We very much appreciate your time here this evening. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, the Doylestown Democrats, for getting us off the ground with this, and to everyone who's donated uh, to the speaker series. And a special thanks to our production team, Bonnie Chang, Jeff Cogskull, Kevin Green, Carl Herring, Melissa Brengan, Connor O'Hanlon, Jenny Robinson, Noni West, and Karen Forbes. Our next interview is a month. It's the fourth Wednesday of March, March 24th at 7 p.m. We'll, we'll be meeting with local school board directors from New Hope Solbury School District, Centennial and Pensbury School District. So do tone, tune in for that. You can sign up starting tomorrow at the DoylestownDemocrats.com website. Please check us out on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube and Twitter. And lastly, there's a quick survey we're gonna ask you to take. It's just 10, 10 questions. If you'll sign a wait and take that survey. And thanks everyone for joining. Have a good evening. Thanks for having Thank us. You. See you in Thank person you very much. soon.